Well, I'm going to say it. I'm not supposed to say it, mostly because I'm a biased realtor doing well for myself. People aren't going to like it, but I simply can't take it anymore. Can we please admit that renting is not okay? Wow, oh, I can already feel the hate coming. But honestly, let me explain before you rant in the comments about how much of an asshole I am. Because honestly, I really believe that if you can own, you should. And if you're in a spot where you can't own, your goal should be to do the best you possibly can to put yourself in a spot where one day you can purchase your principal residence. Again, easy for a realtor to say. And I'm going to share this entire idea here with you, but not until I invite all of you current and aspiring homeowners to subscribe to the channel. And no, not right now, but by the end of this video, if you don't like what I have to say, but you kind of agree, please click the like button for the YouTube algorithm to let other people know that you think renting should not be the goal. And if by this far into the video, everyone has not already clicked the thumbs down button and left a nasty comment and then clicked off, and being one of the ones that's still left here watching, you are hoping to one day own a home, or if you want to upsize to a bigger place, please know that you can book a call with me using the link in the description below at any time. And now let's dive into why I no longer sugarcoat things and tell people it's okay to rent. You see, if you hang out here on YouTube long enough, you will find some number cruncher somewhere that pitches you the idea of this perfect formula of why renting is actually the better thing to do for your life and your finances. This often comes with some crazy plan of how much you have to pay for rent at today's dollars versus how much you'll have to pay on a monthly basis to own with a mortgage. With rentals usually being cheaper, the plan would be to invest the extra money along with your initial down payment into some sort of broad-based index fund on the stock market like VUN or VFM. Because annualized, often these type of index generate better returns than the real estate market. But what these calculations often fail to account for is, well, a few things. First, when you buy a property, you often buy it with 5 to 20 percent down. So this means that if you see an 11 percent return on your index fund, you'll see an 11 percent return on your initial investment and any new money that you've put in. This, along with compound interest over time, is a great thing and, well, yeah, it's a really good investment. But the great power of owning real estate and why so many investors flock there isn't just the fact that homeowners, landlords, and tenants love to sleep inside. But if your home increases over time, as it has for the last 43 years in my market, at an annualized return of 6.6%, well, that gain isn't just on your down payment, but rather on the total purchase price of your property. Next, here in Canada, your principal residence is capital gains exempt, meaning that the home you live in, when you sell it, well, that's all tax-free money. Tax-free, baby! And sure, you might be able to put some of that money in your TFSA into something like VU, but tax-free savings accounts are capped. So if this actually is as great of a plan as they like to make it sound, you will also need to use tax deferral programs like an RRSP. And when that caps out as well, and you finally want to cash in on your investments, you have to pay capital gains, much like you would when you buy an investment property. But here in Canada, again, your principal residence is tax-free. The third thing in these videos and calculations that is often overlooked or misrepresented is the rents you will pay over the next 20, 30, or 40 years. Often these calculations that say renting is better have rents going up at, well, maybe 2% or less per year. And although in some areas here in BC that might be true because we do have some rental limits, it does not account for when your landlord sells and serves you 60 days notice to vacate, causing you to now have to find a new rental at today's market rates that could be now 20 or 30% higher than just a couple of years ago. Now imagine that happens not once, but every maybe three or four years as investors that own your rental unit look to either sell them or take them over as owner occupiers. After all, most of the renters that I help move from a rental unit and buy their first property, they don't hate their landlords or the place they live, but they're really sick of 
getting kicked out and having to find a new rental more often than they like. And that's not even yet mentioning the cost and inconvenience of moving each time. But really, let's face it, I'm just trying to grab your attention when I say there is no good reason to rent. Because, well, there are a few. Number one, if you're in a new city, I think it's best for you to rent for a short period of time, maybe six months to a year to get established and find out where it is you want to live. Take my area, for example. If you move to Vancouver and you can't afford Vancouver, well, where are you going to live? Do you like Ladner, Port Moody, Maple Ridge, Langley? How do you know which ones are the right area for you if you're not from here? You might not know for a while where exactly it is you want to be, and so for sure, rent for a bit. But long term, I'm telling you, it's not ideal. The second reason you should seriously consider renting over top of owning is if you don't plan to own or live in that property for a minimum of five years. Buying and selling real estate is obviously very, very expensive. And if the market dips in the two, three or four year period that you live there and own, then you could maybe even be looking at losses or if you're lucky, break even. So for example, if you just got a new job in a new city, but you know you're only gonna be there on a two year contract and likely don't plan to stay in that new city, well, renting is probably the right move for you. And let's face it, third, if you are afraid of commitment because home ownership is a real commitment, well, then maybe you should just keep renting. And this is where I feel most lifelong renters end up. Initially, they could probably buy into a market when they're young, but they're afraid to be tied down to something. And so they don't commit, ending up further and further behind in the long run. But as I said, and I firmly believe this, I don't think we should be saying that it's okay to rent. I mean, it is, but is it the best thing for you and your future in the long run? I don't think so. But I'm not just saying that because I want to sale and I'm hoping that you want to buy a property. The real reason I say it is this. It's not a complex fictional theory of how much more I might be worth in 30 years if I invest every single extra penny into an index fund and hope that they continue to outperform the real estate market. Nope, it's just simply this simple thought. Rents go up, mortgages go down. Really, that's it. It's that simple. Let's go back in time to demonstrate what I mean. If you bought a home in 2001, let's call it for $170,000 here in my market, you probably would have had a mortgage payment of about $950 per month, assuming that your rate was somewhere around 5.59% with 10% down. And of course, you have other costs on top of that, like property taxes and utilities. Rents, though, were roughly the same price in that period of time. Let's call it $900 to $1,000 per month. Now, for reference, back then, that probably would have bought you a 1,000-square-foot 1950s rancher on a full-size lot here in Surrey. Now, I'm not going to sit here and try to explain to you what the costs and benefits and principal and interests and common pound interest from the S&P 500 or how any of that would work out in today's money. I do know, however, that that property would likely be worth about $1.4 million today, and you would probably have it paid off tax-free. But let's assume here we are now 22 or 23 years in, owing either $900 a month still, or likely the home is paid off because rates were not as high as 5.59% for the last 18 years of which you owned after your first mortgage expired. You're now, say, 50 years old with a paid off house and your bills are, well, let's call it property taxes, utilities, and however many streaming services your little heart desires. And that guy who rented, well, who knows how much he ended up putting into the stock market. But today, he ain't paying that $900 per month anymore for rent. If he or she was lucky and only had a 2% increase in rents the whole period of time and stayed in the same home, they'd be paying about $1,400 per month. And remember, they don't own the $1.4 million tax-free asset. Not only that, let's face it, they've likely had to move once, twice, or many times. If they had to move today and find that same similar style of house to rent that fit their lifestyle, well, that would easily be $3,000 a month or more. And I wouldn't be shocked to see rents in that area for that style of property right now between $3,600 and $3,800. Now, again, I'm not smart enough and I am not a stockbroker. Index fund calculations aside, 
Let's pretend that that guy was, oh, I don't know, a postal worker. In 2001, maybe he made $45,000 per year. And today, I would assume that job is probably in the 65000 to 70000 range. If your house is paid or you maybe only owe another thirty dollars or $40,000 left on it, you are in the clear. But if you have to go from $1,400 rent to $3,400, you're sunk. Likely, with that wage, you can't even make the payment. Now let's take it even further and pretend that that postal worker was paying $1,400 a month and then they retired with that cushy, cushy pension of $3,000 to $3,500. They're sitting pretty, right? Well, if they get served with the notice, like what happened to these folks here in Surrey a few months back? Now, either they get to spend all of that index fund money that they've earned all of these years to subsidize their new rents, or they downsize into something that they can afford. And there's always the possibility that they have to leave the area completely. And if you were to own your home at 55 to 65 years old, retire and move on your own terms only if you really wanted to, well, that's where I think we should all be aiming for. Now, of course, I do have to address the elephant in the room of currently increasing interest rates and payments. Because right now, if you only think about the payments, both rents and mortgages are going up. Yes, I understand that much like in 1982, currently if you take a five-year fixed rate payment today, your payment will be higher than they were over the last few years. I understand that. But over 25 to 30 years, if you have a mortgage, the balance owing will go down. So that is what I mean when I say that rents go up and mortgages go down. The goal for anyone in retirement should be to have their house paid off and that will reduce your cost of living dramatically in your golden years. And then you can enjoy ages 60 or 65 plus and whatever years you have left, with very little or no financial stress. But Steve, what about reverse amortizing mortgages? Yes, this is where my theory in itself has a flaw. Because it appears when you go through a period of rapid inflation and interest rate increases, if you have a mortgage at BMO, TD, RBC, or CIBC, and they are a fixed payment variable rate product? Yes, indeed, right now you're probably not paying off much principal. And a few people might even be adding principal on the end of their loans. And the fact of the matter in that situation is one, I never recommend this type of loan to anyone at all. But still, homeowners seem to love purchasing these loans without fully understanding what they're getting into. And two, yes, right now these loans are a very, very bad thing because of rapidly increasing interest rates. But these rate increases will not go on forever. And this is a tough, tough period of time that's happening right now. And remember that it's going to be a small blip on the overall length of your mortgage paydown by the time you retire. So of course there are situations where people need or want to rent. And obviously I'm not here to shame anyone or tell them that they're not doing it right because let's face it, what do I know? However, I do think that renting should not be considered the goal. Owning your own home, living by your own rules, and never being forced to move should be the optimal desired outcome. So no, I'm not gonna say it anymore. It's not okay to rent simply because rents go up and mortgages go down. And if you agree with me and you're hoping to find out a way to get into the marketplace, know that you can book a call with me right now using the link in the description below at a time that works best for you. Thank you for subscribing, clicking the like button if you agree with me, and we'll see you in a couple of days.